and welcome to the Stratton Group Leasing Museum. Uh, first of all, I want to start off the minutes from the leasing held on the 7th of February. Are you happy for me to sign the office career record? Great, very really appreciate it, thank you. Apologies for absence. Councillors Joe Gilford, Wayne Carrick, Catherine Lomax, and Steve Osborne, and the Chief Executive. To the local. Let's go and listen to the national. Hi, Councillor Richards. Chair, Councillor Ramsey tells me that there is exceptionally is heavy traffic in the oh. Is he here? <laughs> 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 they can tell you about the traffic. They can tell you about the traffic. I should have let you think for yourself. On day 45, before you get to the M1, it's very heavy traffic. Yeah. I got to the end of that. The trouble with the 2Z, if you went and tried to get around it, it didn't work out. <laughs> so he's got you stuck in where he is actually lost in action. <laughs> so, uh, so hopefully he'll find his way back home at least tonight. <laughs> so thanks for that, Ken. Uh, Declaration of members' interests. Okay. Economic regeneration of point issues, parking and damaging estates, Councillor James. Thank you, Dan. <coughs> this uh, report concerns issues about taking parking in damaging town estates. For some years, considerable number of years, there's been a difficulty uh, in parking on some of these estates, largely due to increasing use of cars and also the design of some of the estates. Um, and it's, it's not just in my world, it's throughout the whole of Daventry Town. And this report is concerned with parking in Daventry Town, because I do know that there are difficulties in the villages too. Very serious Nevertheless, uh, as a result of uh, a number of uh, uh, initiatives that have uh, taken place over the years, Chris Long, former Secretary Council, carried out um, quite a bit of work on this. One of the page, uh, as a member of Parliament, as a result of that, the continued complaints that the councillors get about lack of parking space or parking disputes, parking issues, uh, scrutiny uh, set the task panel to investigate the issue. And they made a number of recommendations which are uh, contained on page six, or page two of this report. Uh, Four of those recommendations are subject to being endorsed in this report here. One of them, uh, there is some difficulty perceived with that. So basically what uh, is being recommended tonight is that the council runs an information appeal and campaign around considerate parking on the rules. And clearly uh, something can be done about illegal parking people who consistently park on the path, for example, or cause an obstruction. But it's this inconsiderate parking which is uh, the predominant So that's recommendation one. Recommendation two, that the road joint action groups set step up publicity campaigns where inconsiderate parking causes public danger and to instigate wine, white line markings or traffic regulation orders where appropriate. Uh, three, the council conducts formal research and on that basis adopts minimum parking requirements for any new house building projects or changes to existing dwellings. Now clearly that would need to be looked into uh, by officers much more closely and debated much more widely because there may be implications in respect not necessarily of new estates or new buildings but changing things with regard to existing buildings. That could cause some conflict. I can see that now from the uh, And I'll go list four, I'll come back to that. Five. Uh, <coughs> Capital Road on the Headlands Estate uh, is quite a, a busy road. Uh, it's also uh, used by the buses as well. Uh, Capital Road, uh, well, at least on two occasions, I had a residence there really personally. Uh, one of them was contributed uh, once. I put the phone down uh, because of the swearing on about 5:31. Um, uh, 
saying, what are you going to do about it? Um, can't have this and like the other. Anyway, uh, I myself, the former no fog and verge there, I tripped up in a rut on one wet day. I think I've mentioned it in passing before this. Uh, but uh, for some time, residents have wanted to have uh, the grass of verges on the side of the road, which are quite wide, to have a parking uh, space, a hard standing or access of that, access over the park, uh, 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 to, to get to the hand. Um, there is room for parking there, and I think they've got a pretty good case, because it is a road that's quite busy. Uh, I know people will say, well, what about Middle and Wall Rock, Brad, Timkin, and so on, but there is a case for the Cabo Road because it does have buses go a bit. Um, there's a case there of people putting in uh, those uh, reinforced concrete studs across the uh, grass verges so that the residents can park off road. So, recommendation five is that. MCC be requested to install reinforced concrete stud verges on Capra Road, Daventry, with a view with a view to extending the option elsewhere as appropriate. Now coming back to recommendation four, there are some difficulties with that in, in as much as we uh, do not know the extent of the demand for crossovers. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, it's still not going to stop people who are entitled to use the road, to park on the road, actually parking on the road. So the issue of applying white lines, which uh, the task panel had recommended, causes two problems. One, it doesn't hold the legal position, and secondly, it could be it could be quite unsightly. Uh, mass of white lines. And of course white lines need to be maintained. Uh, that's difficulty number two. Um, the principal one, in my opinion, although one can argue with this, uh, if necessary, uh, is that we don't have the staff resource to take this matter further on our own. Uh, staff are working at beyond capacity at the moment. And uh, in order to develop time to do the proper research that's necessary to investigate the demand and so on and so forth, uh, we require a lot of office of time, uh, which we can't spread around without uh, dropping something else. And no one has suggested what it is, what else we should drop. So what is suggested here or recommended is that because this is a Daventry Town issue rather than a Daventry District issue that in this report, uh, that Daventry Town Council be invited to conclude if there's sufficient resident interest to procure a bulk contract uh, for creating drop, curb, drop curbs uh, in town here. Uh, which of course might result in the cost of individuals being lower than otherwise would have been the case. Uh, to ask the town council to do that, to carry out the investigation, see what it would demand, the extent of the demand is, and how much it would cost, and uh, if, if necessary, carry on with the appropriate works. So those are the five recommendations uh, before you tonight. Uh, Pleasure to Councillor James. Mm -hmm. uh, Councillor Hill. Yeah, I support these recommendations, but the trouble with parking, the inconsiderate parking, without being funny, is cars. There's far too many cars on the road. Families now don't just, in many cases, don't just have one or two cars. Sometimes they have four or five. Um, speaking from experience. When you go into any publicity campaign or whatever, in most cases, for, you'll find for about a week or so, people observe it. And then they go back to London. I've got a case uh, near where I live, at the hillside, which is a winding road, narrow road. People park on both sides. 
and we've had problems with emergency vehicles getting down there so that the, the police, and I reported to the road jack, the police then went and put notices on all the cars. It lasted for about two or three days and they were back to normal. Mm -hmm. Weirds Residents Association have done this twice again and the same thing has happened. So they don't change. That's the biggest problem. It's only temporary before they go back to that sort of situation. And consequently, the uh, fire brigade and the ambulance services said, well, if there is an emergency, tell them that they'd be shunted out the way. And we did that. I had thought, right, that's going to work. But it didn't. So I, I support these, but uh, my biggest concern is that I don't think it is generally going to make that big enough difference unless people observe and take into account and instead of ignoring it or saying oh well yeah we will observe it for a day or two they go back to where where they've been performing the way they've been performing before but we do need something because parking is a problem there's no doubt about it and gradually now as, as families get bigger and we get more cars and things like that it, it is a, an exasperating position Thanks, I do remember some years back the government had a policy where it was a one car per new house. Or, That's right. And of course that made things worse because you had new estates being built and there's only not enough parking for the, for the families living there. That's and people used to park all over the place. So that's one of the problems I noticed. Yeah, I may have come back and say that the biggest problem with that one vehicle, the yeah. household in some cases, yeah. then causes ten parking. Right. And that's where the laziness come in because they start off by parking on the drive and then afterwards one car parked on the drive, the other one parked in the road right. because they don't want to shunt out or cause the other one to shunt out. And that's what happened. And I found that from previous experience in some of my estates. Thanks, Mr. Council. Council Richie. Uh, thank you, Chair, for letting me speak. Um, the issue is one that um, the idea of a task panel for the scrutiny committee uh, arose in discussion with residents in Abbey North in my ward. Right. Um, I have never been quite closely connected with this and with um, grateful for assistance from Councillor Arger at various times and from Councillor Wesley who took it through as the task panel. Um, I'm glad that uh, Councillor James mentioned the work done by my predecessor, Councillor Long. Because in a sense, I was picking up on things that he, in discussions that he had already started. But just one or two things I wanted to say. Uh, Councillor Hills is right that you know that if you if you put around an information um, leaflet asking people to be good, they might be good for a short time. But you know, I don't see that there are any other options. If being good for a short time is better than not being good at all. Um, and considerate parking, or inconsiderate parking, very often is illegal parking, but we know that with the pressures on police and the pressures on the council, that there is actually not much that anybody is going to do about it. And that unless it gets to the stage that the riches in which people will make a formal complaint, no action is going to be taken. So I'm afraid that this, this may not be um, a very satisfactory approach, but nevertheless, it is one that is worth doing. In the Timkin State, just over a year ago, uh, a newsletter was put around almost entirely the testimony of a blind woman about her difficulties because of bad parking and pavement parking for the Timken estate. It's, it's not empirical evidence, but she has come back at various times and said that following that letter, on that newsletter, um, things have been very, very much better. So, oh, you know, uh, we, we, could, we could only hope that things will, 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 will move in that. Um, can I say that in all of these issues, um, there has got to be an assumption that although the, the county council highways uh, may need to be involved and may need to give approval on certain matters, NCC highways doesn't have money for doing anything of this. And in my discussions with them, they have been more of the attitude, well, you know, of course you can do it, 
provided you give us the money to do it. So I think that there has got to be that, you know, that, that recognition throughout. Um, I just want to add, on the basis of the recommendation number three, the formal research, my concern here is that, you know, although there are national standards, we often find that, you know, that the need for cars may be quite different here in Daventry, where we don't have an underground and bus service as you might do if you lived, if you lived in London. Yeah. And therefore, the demand for cars and car usage may be very much greater. Yeah. And that we cannot assume that what works in London is necessarily what will work here. And what would work here might actually be different from Northampton. And as we move towards a, you know, a council involved in that, I think it's important that over the next period, we have something that sets out what we think in this area um, the provision should be should be for parking. Now, I, I'm sure that whatever provision um, our, our, our officers might come up with, it'll be nowhere near, it, 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 oh, sorry, it'll be far in excess of the parking that already exists, particularly on the headlands and the traditional estates. Um, can I just say to you, on the, 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 you know, the references to Cowper Road, I don't know if people have actually looked at Cowper Road. Um, there was even a plan, uh, a, a sort of, I don't know if it was a Chris Long drawing or an architect's drawing, but there was a drawing of how a parking base could be put into the Cowper Road. I conducted a survey in Cowper Road amongst <coughs> residents. <coughs> the, most of them came back and said, well, actually, no, there's not a parking problem on Cowper Road because we all park at the Burgess. Um, some of them have already put down gravel. Yeah. Some of them have put down, some of them have put down um, paving stones and things, which I'm told are all totally illegal. There is one resident who has actually done something which is illegal, and that is put up a little ring around at the, the bit of grass in front of the house to say that no, you can't park here. Uh, so it, you know, it is an area where residents, after a long, long period of waiting, have almost taken things under their own control. They have pressed for a long time about having studded, dressed concrete, uh, and for a long time the county council has said that its policy is not to use it. We are now told that they are reviewing that and there are actually a lot of places in the county where they are and therefore we feel that a unit that this could be a way of actually moving ahead. Can I, can I address this question of um, dropped curves? And it relates to, to the paragraph that is there on Burton's Road. Uh, for those of you who know Burton's Road, it is it is sort of only northern entrance well, rather than taper way into another housing estate. It would have been northern entrance into the headlands, which is a very big estate. Buses and everything else must use it. But it is narrow and, and it has got a right angled corner when you get to the end. Um, you couldn't move along that road if people parked on both sides. And therefore you have people who are certainly on the north side, frankly all of them park on well, the front part, so it's very little that actually grows there, but that is, that, you know, that is where they park. Now, some of these people are actually parking there illegally. They haven't been given permission by the county council, they've never applied to the county council for permission to have a formal dropped care. If we require them to be legal and had to park on the road, it would make Burns Road quite impossible. Now, it seems to me that that's a sort of absurd position for us to be in. We can't ask them, surely, to put up the money to help us to keep that road clear. On the, on the papers, there is a, there is a reference um, on drop curve somewhere to a figure of just can't for the moment find it in your report. But there are two figures that you, that, 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 that you give. 235 and 500. 235 
is the is the key pivot to to high rates. That's right. And I wonder why it's 235. If you lived in Warwickshire, the equivalent fee is 75. I'm not sure why it should be that much more expensive in Northampton than if you just happen to move across into Warwickshire. So it rather breaks me that there is that, you know, that hugely high cost. As for the 500, I was told initially that the cost for contractors for putting in a drop curve are generally something in excess of 2,000. Yeah. Um, I did follow this up with the, um, the list of approved contractors that NCC has. Um, one of them sent me, simply said, well, here is the, the latest invoice that I have issued for a drop curve, and it's fairly typical. It's 2,082. Now that means there's something approaching two and a half thousand that you would expect people to pay for a drop care. People in Burns Road can't pay that sort of money. I would like to suggest that with this, I find it very frustrating needing to deal with, you know, with highways and with other people to bring them together. But DDC finds a way of bringing together the relevant council officers, people from highways, and hopefully you'll get more response than I've ever got from Futures Housing to come and actually sit down and talk through what are the options, how you get over this. Highways insists that even although the car is very, very low and they wouldn't even bother changing it, that they need to do work because the drop curve is not simply the curve stone, but it is strengthening the pavement. You look around the headlands and anywhere else where people regularly park in the pavements, where the, without the strengthening process have been done, they drive over the pavements, where you have heavy trucks that sit on the pavements. I have seen no evidence of the pavements not being capable of supporting, of supporting cars that would just be driving over to park in a garden. It strikes me that, you know, that what has been demanded here is almost a bit of a rip-off of residents that are not in a position to pay for it. So I would suggest that I, I, I cannot see any point in trying to pass this one to the, you know, to the town council. There are serious amounts of money here, and I think the only way of getting around the size of that budget is to have a sensible conversation with highways, not about what is in the rules, but what actually is the minimum that is necessary to be done. Thank you. Thanks, Gareth Richard. Just a couple of observations there about the broader picture. Interesting comment about the unitary position in the year's time, about the rural area and the urban area of Northampton. This is a good example where there might be two different sort of standards because of the different nature of the areas. I think that's quite an interesting point. Another point about um, parking in roads like cul de sacs where there's no other place to park but on the curb. There can be a real risk there. You might be blocking emergency vehicles because people are parking on the pavement both sides. And you know, sometimes it's a very small gap I can have from my own experience and you have to squeeze through. That's because there's not enough parking for the houses there. And I think it goes back to this policy some years ago where you only allowed one space per house or one and a half spaces per house, I think it was, on brand new estates, which made it very, very difficult to have cars parked everywhere. And he's going to enforce that because people need to park somewhere. That's one of the difficulties, I think. That's my personal view, anyway. Uh, we'll come back on those points a bit later. Councillor Chandler. Thank you, Chairman. A um, couple of points. Uh, one is that if people do park on the pavement, it makes it very difficult for somebody in a wheelchair or with a buggy or a, something of that nature. But uh, my concern is with the, um, recommendation number three about uh, the council adopting minimum parking requirements for um, changes to existing dwellings. I could see this creating an awful lot of work uh, unnecessarily because many changes to existing dwellings are, would have minimal effect on, on the party. Uh, and of course some changes can be done under committee development in which case we might not know that it's been being done. So it does seem that that might be uh, something that uh, perhaps has already been considered, I don't know, but it just seems to me rather odd that uh, that, that should be included there. Thanks, Councillor Charles. We'll come back on this at the end, if you don't mind. Councillor Walker. Yeah, I'm grateful for the, 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 uh, the task panel having a look at this. It, and I suppose, thinking about it logically, you know, I would like a more robust 
process of dealing with uh, inconsiderate or unlawful parking. Uh, but I appreciate policing priorities and um, the powers to PCSOs to, 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 to deal with the traffic acts are limited. So, um, but I'm grateful for the work put in. Just on point four, I think that is a good idea to invite the town council. I, I've having, having regular meetings with uh, town council members. Um, both uh, outside and inside the chamber. I know they've always been uh, interested in taking on more responsibilities. I think this invitation uh, could be well de debated by uh, the councillors there to see how they feel about it. But also I think that sort of ownership is maybe one area they may well, well wish to provide some of the impetus that, that to be honest, at the time we as DCC have felt, and certainly um, the, the, the county have felt in trying to deal with this intractable problem by, by providing some of the facilities that we need to improve parking. With regards to point five uh, about Cowper Road, uh, I know that Council Richie tried with the, uh, with the uh, using the grants to try to fund it, which wasn't successful. Um, you know, it may well be to, to have a discussion on whether we could revisit that um, when the new monies are available to, to explore that again. But if, if the letter is written to uh, Northamptonshire County Council, if I could be informed, I've, I've lobbied on this. I've had people out. In fact, I was the one that put those drawings together with regard to Cowper Road. Um, I would like to know uh, if, if I'm allowed to, to know that that letter's been sent or even copied into it so I can provide a letter in support of that to say, look, you know, this hasn't gone away. Um, we're we're two, two years down the line from when I first raised it. And, uh, and and so I'd like to try and support that process. I'm not saying that, that, that it'd be successful. I've done a lot of lobbying over the last 18 months um, from different areas with regard to parking. It is a thorn in the cycle. I do have great sympathy for the residents. You know, it, 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 it does look like total chaos sometimes uh, there. And, and sometimes I feel collectively you know, the town, the districts, and the county are sometimes a little bit impotent on actually resolving the problems, which does require investment. Um, that's that's a frustration, but we can only work in the environment that we're in. So, uh, so yeah, I'm grateful for the work done, and we'd just like that point to to, to carry on lobbying. Uh, that's just really that's all. Again, I just reiterate the unitary points. In a year's time, we are the three boroughs form the unitary. Yeah. Town Council will have a bigger role then in terms of the local area, and I certainly may want to consider on the point you raised on point four there. I, I think that's quite, quite a clever idea. I don't, I don't know who put that one forward, but I think it's the sort of area that maybe the town councils can excel at and, and help the residents. So this is your consideration now. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I don't think we should compel the Senate for them to have a chance to, to yeah. view their opinions. Thank you. Councillor Wesley. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, um, Nice to hear the comments coming back from this report, and it's a fair bit of work waiting to from me and Councillor Ritchie. Um, I have to say, get, I think we were both slightly disappointed when we started looking at this as to what we could do. Obviously, the, the primary function of this is actually the, is actually the county you can go for the inventory. So we were a little bit stymied in what we could say, so just to put that into the context. But what we were believing was that uh, Dunphy District Council could hopefully perhaps give this some impetus maybe with the county and possibly going forward into unitary to just make it a topic of discussion in uh, in changes going forward. You know, parking is an issue, there's all sorts of historic stuff. There was the more recent legislation and of course there's all the, the houses built before people had one, two cars and when cars were smaller. So we are stuck with the, with the historic situation. But and I understand that Councillor Hill says that you know maybe people won't do this, but you've got to try and do something. It's um, you know I think we owe we owe the residents that, um, and um, because it is it is an actual major issue, and it isn't just in Daventry. And I will agree this report was primarily about Daventry estates. Part of the reason for that was just to keep it under control a little bit, otherwise it would have just got completely and utterly out of hand. But myself and Councillor Ritchie really, really believe that there's absolute lessons here to be learned that can be applied across the whole area. For instance, the, the grass creek, I know that's a trade name, but for instance that could actually be used in anywhere if it proves, if it can be proved successful. 
the, the concrete, uh, the concrete um, where the grass grows up through the concrete holes on the verges. So you still get a grass verge, but you've got a solid underneath to it. If you want to have a look down the country park, um, Colin, then uh, just by the traffic lights, there's a bit, there's a bit there actually where people walk over and it protects the grass. So it's, a, it's an interesting, it is an interesting, um, it's an interesting concept. Um, so yeah, we understood, we understood that they, you know, this was a cure all for everything. We were hoping possibly a cure for something and maybe for it to be used and rolled out going forward to, uh, for other areas. Um, I have no problem with, with, the, uh, uh, with the recommendation number four being changed from the district council to the town council, but I would be, I would be happier if it was district council and the town council working together to try and push the, uh, the county council because well, what we were really thinking there was it's the impetus of this council and the standing. It's, it has got more resources and it is a, it's a bigger voice. You know, a parish council, a parish council is always a relatively small voice going into the county. A district council is a, is a lesser voice going into the county and it's, it's quite a long way away. I'm, I would like to think that the town council could have, have an input on this and, and offer assistance and help because I think every, virtually every town council understands that there are issues on, on car parking. What I would like to say as well, that's not lost work by the district council because again, this applies to the whole, of, this could apply to the whole of the district going forward. So it's not a parochial, it's not a par parochial thought by any manner or means. Um, as far as Councillor Chandler's um, words about about um, standards and what's expected on that, our thoughts on that were that obviously if there's no if there's no impact on car parking from the development, then it wouldn't be a planning issue. Um, but what we are saying is that if there is a if there is a change to an existing development that removes car parking spaces from that development, then it should be taken into account. And we felt that across the board, very often in our in deliberations in the planning committee, we actually haven't got anything on car parking to actually come back with. So we rely on the NCC. Uh, highways to come up with a solution and very often our officers will say well we completely disagree with NCC so we won't be doing that um, so just if that's not really a reason and then NCC says and we say we have to agree with NCC because it's their it's their decision I think and again this would cover we see this actually covering the whole of the district so rural areas town areas and there may be slightly different standards involved but and that just to put some sort of um, some sort of sense on it because I'm positive though I know this applies across in the villages I and mean, then I think you'll see probably in planning next week in Long Buckby there's people complaining about car parking spaces being taken away. This happens all the time. And we just thought it was an opportunity to maybe at least start the debate and you know you know I know it is work but there are there are there must be other councils that uh, have done this work and there must be other there must be other items and there must be thought processes from our planners that can put something at least sensible as a framework in there and that's why we put it in place. And just got to thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Councillor Wesley, for those comments. I just wanted to say the, the rural areas do have parking forces at villages and they're big ones. Yeah. So you're quite right to say it's just not the town, it's actually the possible. Well, I'll just, I'll just add the yeah. Jack stuff actually came out, but the Jack stuff has actually been done in the villages on that, yeah. on, the, uh, on, on the actual campaigns and things where dangerous parking is stopped. So yeah. stopping fire engines and ambulances. That's right, that's exactly right. Places, so. You know, so it's Especially around the schools, exactly. that. Yeah. And what about Cal putting the one name there, Calvary Road, of course, there's lots of other people say, so what about my road? And that's one of the dangers, of course. You've got to start somewhere. I mean, that's that's, and that's how we saw it, because otherwise it's a mammoth, it's a mammoth yeah. project. Yeah. Thank you, Clark. Uh, Councillor Randall. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm, well, I've read all through these um, recommendations, and I just felt that there wasn't enough information or background information to hardly any of them, because on number one, where it says the council runs an information appeal campaign around considerate parking and rules, 
does that mean that something going to every household or was it in problem areas? But I thought, if it's in problem areas, then why not incorporate that in item number four to get a feel of um, who would be interested? So just link that campaign into one. And I felt if there was enough staff time to um, do one, why was there not enough staff time to do number four if it was incorporated together? Um, the other thing that I wondered about was um, if people do pay to have a drop curb, do, do they then get that drop curb white lined so there's nobody parks there? Because if not, how does somebody know not to park across that if they're paid for it if they haven't? Um, and obviously the figures, I, I'd known, I, I knew that it was around about 2,000 because I know of residents that have paid to have it done. So I was um, quite interested to know how these figures um, on page 13 had only come to 735 when I know a lot of residents had paid um, over £2,000. Um, as for the um, town council being invited, um, I'm sure that it will be something that maybe seal money could be used for, but the issue here is how much money it costs when you have to go through an authorised contractor that NCC has on their list that charge absolute extortionate prices compared with a local builder that does exactly the same job for a third of the price. So I think really that could almost be something to work in conjunction with the district council on whether there could be a negotiation that a as long as the contractor meets that specification, I don't feel it should be have to be somebody like Alpha BT or you know or some of these names act that you you pay for the name. I know there's lots of local contractors that have said they can do you know these jobs for. You know, even a quarter of the price that NCC contractors <coughs> charge. So to me, there is quite, you know, to me that's something that really wouldn't take a lot of time just to negotiate whether it could be a local contractor that could do that work. And I'm sure then Dumptry District, um, Dumptry Town Council would say that's something that we could use as a community project and we could, you know, put some seal money um, towards that because obviously it's going to help the community if those cars are you know, off the, off the road. So, but I, so I just felt like reading down with the information that there was. Um, road Jack, Road Jack, I mean, who funds Road Jack? Have they got time to launch a campaign? Because I thought, I don't know where the money comes from for Road Jack and what time they have, because I only, you know, I don't know. So, so reading through that, I just felt there wasn't enough information um, to make a recommendation for all these going forward. Okay, these are a couple of scrutiny improvement calls, so just to remind them at that point, oh. Councillor Randall. I would point away to you on that one is I know that contractors have to be specifically qualified and have the experience and expertise to do the work. You can't just have Joe Boggs down the road doing it. They actually need people that actually are accredited to do this kind of work we're talking about there to the right standards. I, I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying, but again, I come back to the unitary point that when we form the unitary in the year's time, the county and the boroughs won't be there with the one unitary. That's the opportunity maybe to get some of this stuff you're talking about, looking at the contracts, how they actually how they actually are, the sort of cost they charge and how they actually operate. It might be time to review that. Uh, coming on to the next, we'll come back in a moment to these points that have been raised. I'll come back when I can. Uh, Councillor Warren. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for allowing me to uh, speak. Uh, the report highlights the, the problem of parking and it's already been mentioned that it's not just purely in the town and, and it has been mentioned throughout the, the, the district. But I'd just like to point out that I believe that it's going to be an even greater problem in the coming years because of the, the huge amount of development that we've got throughout the district. Yeah. And on the newest estates, the, the developers are building roads to the bare minimum width. And that, and along with the allocation of parking per house is not sufficient for the individual houses so therefore you, you end up, which has already been stated, that you know, parking on the street and because of the narrowness of the new roads on these estates, you've only got to get one person parking outside, the parallel parking on the other side, you can't, it's just non-existent. So it's not just now that we've got the problem, it's going to be a problem that is going to be getting worse throughout the district. I agree. Thank you for that, Councillor Warren. Councillor Morgan. 
Thank you, Chairman. Uh, a couple of things, actually. I wanted to pick up on that point about Councillor Warren. One of the points I wanted to make, and that is about forward-looking. Yeah. Um, and, of course, um, it's problematic now. Imagine what it would be like in a few years' time when we're having to charge cars and elect uh, electrical charging. Uh, I've often thought about this, actually, and I thought a very uh, historically, when I was the chair of scrutiny, actually, this started when I was chair of scrutiny, when the council which you brought it forward. Um, one, of the, one of the, I think I raised it by then, actually, we perhaps need to look even further ahead and see how electrical charging is incorporated into um, designs of developments going forward. Could you imagine in such a point a couple of years' time where you've not only got all the cars out there, but you've got all the electrical cables as well? That could be a very fundamental problem. We're only we're talking about 20 years' time, so it's design it in. Um, going back to the other points, Councillor Randall mentioned uh, communication. I think one, since, since this is a district-wide issue, we've identified many parts of the district, uh, a very simple communication method, of course, would be damage recording. Uh, obviously, we want targeted communications, but we can have a generic communication about good behaviour and parking. And, uh, the, the final two points, I think it's very easy to do nothing at the minute because of the unitary issue, but um, it does also strike me that sometimes doing nothing at this stage is probably easier than uh, when we talk into a different authority where we'll become the same authority going forward. That said, I still think we need to take some action now as the uh, report suggests. And uh, finally, uh, as one of the team that will be talking to the town council, about activity going forward. I certainly welcome this opportunity and I'd like to see this perhaps part of the agenda for the conversation we're going to have in the coming month uh, to see if we can move this forward. Subject to being um, approved tonight and uh, approved for the council. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for the Councillor Morgan. Councillor Richie. Thank you for allowing me to come back. Um, three quick points. Um, firstly, in response to Councillor Morgan, yeah, I have put to the damage recalling goes to everybody. And there needs to be something, a piece that goes into that and recall. I suspect, however, and if you ask any marketing people, you will tell them that this is the case, that if you want to have impact, it has got to go as a separate bit of paper. Um, it, raises, it raises the questions about, well, how do you deliver it? Do you simply put it as an insert in that and recall? It probably has good extra costs. But I can tell you, <coughs> certainly in most parts of, of Abbey North, there are already residents groups that you get the leaflets and they will make sure that they they will they, they will volunteer to get them out to people. So I think that, you know there is more impact if you have a card that you can actually put through somebody's door that sort of stands separately. And I would I would urge the council to think about having such a card, even if it is there and you make it freely available to people who are prepared to take it and to get it distributed. The residents know it is a problem, I know that's one year. <coughs> um, just very briefly, on the issue of, of local contractors, there's one guy who's a landscape gardener who spends time putting in grass concrete in other places, who actually lives in Piper Road. But his problem is that he has got public liability insurance, cover up to, I believe, it's a million. But to be on the NCC list, it would need to be up to three million. Now, I, I, I find it difficult to think about you know, why it needs a premium <coughs> risk if you're putting down grass concrete in Cowper Road. And I suspect that a lot of the requirements that the, 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 the county council makes perhaps are not, are, you know, are not calibrated to the sort of work that we're actually talking about. So it's in these things in which it needs to think, have a rational discussion. My main one I wanted to follow up on though. Um, drop curves, I would say, even if you got 5% reduction, it is still an awful lot of money. Um, at the time that these recommendations were made, it wasn't thought that it was going to be an open invitation to people to get a free or a, or a subsidized drop curve. It is just in very particular places where there, you know, we know there's a problem. I referred to, I referred to um, Burns Road. The north side of the Burns Road probably doesn't have more than, say, a dozen houses, and many of them probably have been dropped curves already. There may be small parts of, I can think of Hume's Road, or places where the buses need to go around corners in, um, you know, in Tennyson Road. And that we're only talking about um, 
enough of it is made in places where there is an identified problem. And by going for places where you just, you know, the council can identify and decide what's an identified problem. And so the number, the number of households to which the offer is made can be, can be constrained to what budget there is that's available. But I think it's also got to remember that many of the homes where there is a problem, it may be rented accommodation, and in many cases, it is going to be a housing association, most often futures. And, 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 and therefore, there's a case for landlords and the housing associations being involved. Because if you put in um, a properly constructed drop curb and a um, place for parking a car in a garden, um, it, it, it may not increase the value of your property by the 2500 that you've spent, but it must do something for the value of the property. So I think that there needs to be some wider discussion. But it is not, it is not suggesting in this report that there, you know, that there should be um, an open-ended offer that could end up um, you know, costing, costing millions. It is something that ought to be highly targeted to where, you know, to where it, you know, it can clearly be seen. It's not just that some people like a drop curve, but it's that it's that, that we would like there to be a drop curve so that the traffic can still flow. Thank you, Councillor Chief. Councillor President. Thank you, Chairman, for allowing me to speak. Um, we keep hearing about drop curves. Um, about two or three years ago, I had uh, a resident from down the Indians contact me. Out of the blue, he had a letter come from Northampton County Council about he's parking his car in his garden and he needs a dropped curb, etc. But what would the point was, it wasn't just the dropped curb because they had to look at the path to see what sort of condition it was in, um, whether it was good, whether they'd have to replace some of it. Because if you've got a car going over that two or three times a day, sometimes there's water pipes, etc., in the paths. And they had to make sure that the path was strong enough to take the car over without um, damaging anything underneath. So it's not just a drop curve half the time, it's everything. Thanks for that observation, Catherine. The thing I find interesting about all this is the, because I know from my own experiences that uh, parking in these estates, which is not enough, it's not enough parking availability, mm. that people will park in an inconsiderate manner, manner on pavements, just to give up Catherine Charlton's point, to then try and give a bit of space for wheelchairs and what have you. Mm. The truth is, unless they park there, they can't park anywhere. Mm. And I think that's one of the real challenges about when you design new estates, when you design new developments, this should be really at the forefront. And I think a few years back we had major concerns about this when obviously the parking spaces were not enough in our view for these new estates, which I think has come to fruition. And then the word that hasn't been used tonight is enforcement. And who's going to enforce that when in fact residents would quite right to turn as well in a second? There's not enough parking spaces for us anyway. You're going to actually penalise me for parking. If you park on the road, you may be blocking access to emergency vehicles. And if there's not enough parking spaces there, we have to park somewhere. And therefore it's on the pavement, half on the pavement, half not on the pavement. And I think that's one of the challenges we all face, is trying to get the right conclusion. Having said that, I think it's been a very interesting debate. We have a lot of people participating. Who would like to kick this off in terms of some responses? Maria? Uh, um, I can... Especially on the planning side, maybe. Yeah, so um, I've made a few notes. Um, you asked what the road jack is. The road joint action group is a very well established community citizen <coughs> action group that's chaired across Dumpshire and South Northamptonshire by the council's community safety manager because um, our teams in Dumpshire and South Northamptonshire actually alternate which ones they cover. It's, um, it involves police officers, fire and rescue, Highways England, Northamptonshire Highways, and it's all about getting together to solve a whole range of other highways issues. It has very effectively piloted new projects and resolved all number of problems, including some disturbing um, inconsiderate parking issues. And as Councillor Richie said, community involvement and providing leaflets and working together with the community is absolutely key. When that happens, when the pilots where we've um, where we've got involved in, in that, it, you, you can get long-term fixes. Um, there was a question about charging points, electrical charging points. We'd be pleased to hear that one of the um, large SUEs, which is at the early stages of discussion now, because it's so near to an air quality management area in Northampton, 
that is being designed. So all family homes have charging points with off road parking, and where there, where there are accommodation like flats or whatever without any off road parking, then there's communal ones in the areas. So that is being designed in. Um, there was mention of parking standards. Um, the County Council parking standards have not been adopted by this council. I don't think any others have either, because um, to put it as politely as I can, they're unworkable in many parts of our district. Yeah. Um, and I think that probably covers the points for me. Thank you. Sorry? I would probably just add one thing, Chair, which is there's been a discussion about the idea of a bulk contract, about the cost of the approved contractors. Now, realistically, we haven't got the officers at present taking this forward. Is it's a lot more to it than perhaps leads the eye. But if the town council does want to take it forward, then you want to see a situation where if, for the sake of argument, 50 or 75 residents all say, yes, I would like a drop curb, then that package can be put out to tender. Um, it's probably then worth a contractor who perhaps isn't on the list currently putting a price in, and pricing for the grand or so it cost them for their enhanced public liability insurance. When you divide the, the, that cost across a large number of drop curves, it's a very small amount each. And therefore, potentially, a much better price is obtained than the Valparvites of this world would offer. So it's potentially quite a creative solution to the problem that might well address the needs of the residents uh, without having to public money, except from some of the organisational bits and pieces. Um, and I would suggest to the committee that that's probably the best way to start. You know, if that's tried and fails, then OK, it might be appropriate to do something else. But as a first move, it's a way of opening up the market, empowering residents to get access to service at better value, and then see what happens. Thank you, Simon. Go back to your point earlier, Maria, about the SUE. Is that in the involved area? I can't remember off the top of my head. Just go back to Council Warren's point. It's a huge housing growth plan for your area, Council Warren. So, again, that's saying you want to see planning maybe taking into account the parking issues. And the, you know, not like before when there weren't enough sufficient spaces, or equally to actually make sure they do some work around making sure that it's not going to be any hiccups moving down the line. And I think the point about electric vehicles is very, very interesting because, you know, the charging points maybe will become a thing in the future when the new houses are built. The one was in a bit like, you know, super fast broadband and ultra fast and all that stuff being put into new estates now. That would go alongside that. With, with that, the, the actual um, power supply into the, the housing has got to be three phase for the, the electric, whereas it's, it's just two forty. No. no. Is that, that, is that not two. correct? No, uh, Chair, I have speak from personal experience. It doesn't matter. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> I, I was under the impression that the, uh, a much uh, beefier um, electricity supply was needed for um, the, the fast charge that was required. Um, the fast, probably for a very a fast charge, probably, but not a general domestic. Well, you say, because you know, normally it, uh, electricity, if you just put it on the slow charge, it's going to be, you know, for hours. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest that really, you know, the fast charge need, would need to be put in. Then, I mean, it's, it is relatively simple in new housing, and it's going to be three phase. The only important thing with new housing is that the main views are in the incoming views that's on the, um, can, the not the consumer side, the other side of the supply needs to be of sufficient capacity and that's all. Oh, all right. It doesn't need a three-phase supply. Okay. Basically. Uh, okay, so I think we had a response to officers. Back to you, Councillor James. Anything you want to wrap up with a good thing or not? We've got the five recommendations. No, I think I think we've had a good thing. Yeah. And uh, I would like to thank the task panel for all yes, the right. yeah. I thought sort they of had a difficult job to do, actually. They've done a good job. Thank you. I think this will feed in nicely for future work in this area when you become a bigger authority. Yeah. Are you happy to accept the five recommendations? Yes, yes. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> We move on now to corporate issues, local government pension scheme, discretion, Mr. Councillor Griffiths. Members will note that it is necessary to us to review our discretion scheme in the five areas as set out in the introduction to this report. That's on page 21. Um, and also in regard to the 2014 scheme, there are no recommendations to reduce any of the benefits employees might be eligible for, but the discretions recommended for adoption by council 
represent a continuation of existing policy with the addition of greater flexibility. Um, 4.3 is particularly informative on page 22. Um, bearing that in mind, um, you will have used the summary of proposed changes on page 23 to compare with the Appendix A. And members will find the definition of compassionate grounds helpful. We will need to keep the pensions discretion policy under review and updated to ensure it continues to be relevant. And flexibility means that the council will be required to consider applications on their merits. I ask therefore that members um, recommend the changes. Thank you, Mr. Dean, Councillor Griffin. Are there any comments or observations? Uh, Councillor Randall. No, yeah, I just wondered if there's usually um, flexibility when this comes under review, and if not, why? Because I've read through it, but there was a lot of things that I really didn't understand at all, really, like the 85-year rule um, got flexibility on that. I just didn't understand what actually it was, what it was saying. Okay. Mm -hmm. no, um, thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I think the, the main changes are actually driven by the uh, a review of our uh, scheme that's been carried out by the Pension Administration Authority. And essentially, last time we looked at it, um, we, uh, as, as a council, agreed that a lot of the discussions wouldn't actually be taken up. And quite rightly, the, the, the review has come back and said, well, if the policy is not to apply this discretion, then effectively there isn't a discretion. So largely, the changes have, have been around language where we're now saying the council does not use the award, um, the, the particular discussions, as opposed to the council will not. Um, so that's largely what the changes are, are there. I think there's a couple of new new parts which are set out in the uh, in the table. But essentially, that's, that's what it is. It, it, it is a technical paper um, in, in terms of the scheme, but we're doing what we're asked to, to do by the administrative authority. Thanks, Ben. And just to wrap on that, will there be any extra cost to the public purse if some of these discretions are put into practice? Thank you. This is good. Um, I mean, in the report, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, section 5.1 talks about the financial impacts and uh, yeah. no, no immediate financial implications in applying the additional uh, flexibility. Thank you. Any other comments? I'm happy to agree the recommendation. Agree. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was asking to Councillor Guildford's absence just to leave on this report because I had a heavy association with Pension Wage Partnership for many years because Councillor Guildford can't be here this evening. It's a fairly straightforward report, it's a tiny up exercise basically, uh, but also it's important to keep the, uh, the membership clear. The Waste Partnership has been going about 17, 18 years now and has proved to be a very successful partnership between the seven boroughs and the County Council. And of course, now going into the unitary, I'm sure it will continue, whether it be one or two partnerships, but the way it seems to course. But clearly, I think it's all there. I have to take any questions, or Simon can take any questions also, if there are any. If none, are you happy to set any recommend two recommendations? Thank you. Uh, move on now to strategic planning issue, Overston Hall, Restoration, Councillor Chamber. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Overston Hall is uh, one of the jewels in our crown of uh, heritage assets, uh, so much so that um, in addition to the corporate objective as expressed in our corporate strategy and also in, our, in the joint core strategy, that we should continue to um, conserve and enhance and make use of heritage assets. Uh, Overston Hall receives a, a special mention in the part two plan, which is now with the Secretary of State. And uh, we're looking forward to the examination in June. I believe we've been given a date on that, which is helpful. Um, we did resolve in December 2013, or the council did, that the council was willing to take proactive steps to secure the future and restoration of Overston Hall, and it subsequently resolved in 2016 that it would work in partnership with the new owner of Overston Hall to achieve its restoration 
based on the approach in historic England uh, policy on enabling development. So all we're asking for here, Chairman, and I won't prolong the discussion, I hope, uh, is that uh, we recommend to Council that Council continues to support the restoration of Overton Hall, including through enabling development of a justified scale and nature, uh, if that is required, and that unless it becomes evident it wouldn't be necessary, that we should develop a planning brief for Overton Hall uh, as set out in this report. This is just to make sure that there is a clear understanding of, in everybody that they understand uh, what is intended. And uh, to say going through uh, all of the report, I hope people have read it, if I draw people's attention to paragraph 4.9 on page 69, it therefore lists as uh, five bullet points of the proposed approach to the uh, drawing up of this supplementary planning document uh, that we should record for everybody to see um, what is important about Overston Hall and its setting, including the parkland. We should outline the main options for the future of Overston Hall. Uh, there are a number. Uh, we should make it clear what the likely net costs and means of funding options which are worth serious consideration, uh, where it's likely that any of these options would be would justify enabling development as in the National Planning Policy Framework and as uh, in the guidelines issued by Historic England, and if relevant, that the important characteristics which should be respected in any replacement building should it turn out that the best option is to replace the building. So um, it should help focus efforts on uh, most likely to be productive avenues for uh, future work. We know that uh, we, we consider this in the context of the current owner having uh, submitted applications for plans for uh, a consideration by this authority for the uh, restoration and conversion of the hall to some use which is in line with our policies and, and uh, aspirations and that uh, it is likely that that would involve uh, some enabling development as set out in national and local policy. And I would also draw members' attention to the uh, I won't say it's a warning, it's just a reminder at the last paragraph of 5.3, the legal constitutional implications. Members of strategy group or council must ensure that they avoid uh, any predetermination about those applications uh, in uh, considering any uh, discussions of Overston Hall. Uh, it's very important that we uh, act, continue to act lawfully uh, as a planning authority so that, that our decisions cannot be challenged. Uh, and the decision about uh, uh, whether or not we like the plan for the proposals for uh, re uh, restoration and reuse of the hall are separate entirely from any proposals for enabling development and they must be dealt with accordingly. Thank you, Councillor Chancellor. It's very wise to highlight that because it is a life planning application. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Chancellor. Yes, thank you. Um, I've never really been in um, favour of this one because it, it I can remember reading um, a report um, by this council um, quite a number of years ago and when I read the report, when it comes to the conclusion at the bottom, um, the re recommendation was that the building was to be demolished because it was going to be far too costly to restore it. And years later, this sort of come back again before us where it had been weathered much, much more, so the cost then was going to be even more. Now, sold... Um, the building's been um, sold, and I was at a <coughs> planning meeting, um, and the developer has put forward to restore part of the building and put some houses on the site. But the cost still didn't add up. So by going ahead with this, no, but going ahead with this, 
to approve this, does this mean that on that land there's going to be a lot more houses built? That's all, you know. Or, oh. or not. Or, Sorry, because if just, it is. Just confirm that point. Uh, Sorry. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah. Just two points I made. Yeah. I'm sure we've discussed this before, but the report Councillor Amber referred to was not prepared by or on behalf of this council. Yeah. It was prepared by the previous owners of the hall who one might reasonably think had a vested interest in an outcome being one recommended. <laughs> um, so please set that to one side. As far as this advice is concerned, what we're proposing is a balanced, objective assessment of how important the hall is and what's important about it, and therefore what would or would not be justified to secure its restoration. Yeah. So no, proving this would not mean it's more likely the house was built, it means you're more likely to have a sensible policy framework in order to make the decision about those houses or anything else that might be proposed by way of that development. Thank you, Simon. Okay, that's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Councillor Wesley. Yeah, just, um, just confirming the costings on this. I think it says in the report that it's officer time only. Yeah. Is, is, that, uh, is that correct? Yeah. Or are we looking into um, employing experts and consultants no, and etc. etc. et cetera? Chairman, uh, the report says the correct position. There is a very substantial amount of expert work that's been done. Uh, both by this council and by those applying various forms of permission, that can be drawn by expert officers we have together to perform the basis of document consultation, uh, then consults, and then they work their way through. But no, not expecting to commit external work. Thank you, Chair. Very much, Councillor Ritchie. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I, I don't doubt that this is really thorny, um, but. I'm looking at the, at the bullet points, the five bullet points in 4.9. Um, Councillor Chancellor made the point that trying to um, save this house, um, preserving it for the future, is very much in accordance with our policies. Um, it strikes me that the whole principle of enabling development is that you do something that is not in accordance with your policies. Otherwise, it wouldn't be enabling development. <laughs> um, there's a cost, there's a, there's a large cost that needs to be paid um, if, this, if, this, if this house is going to be brought back into use, or even if it's going to be secured so that it doesn't cause a danger to anybody who's taking a look at it. Um, but paying that cost by offering a plot of land that would not otherwise be a place where you could build, offering that to a developer, it strikes me that you're transferring the cost to another group of people. Perhaps the people in the village that are going to need to put up with enabling development, or people whose views or whose amenities are going to be uh, lost through um, through having uh, a housing estate in a place that normally we would not allow a housing estate. It strikes me that there is something that is fundamentally flawed about that approach. We're saying that yes, that there is a cost, but the people that it will be paid for by some different community because they are going to need to put up with the enabling development. Um, I just feel that we need to know what the costs are and you know what you know what the options are that do not really simply transfer the costs to you know, you know to other people. I just find that there is something that is slightly distasteful about the whole approach. I appreciate that it may be an approach that councils across the land use to save buildings like this. But I would be much more interested to know well, what other things might be done that might fall short of bringing the building um, back into full use. Um, I hope that the, that, that, that the planning brief that's proposed here will actually look at what, you know, what actually are the options. You know, do we, we want to preserve the building because it is, it is interesting, it is historic, it, we hope it is pleasing to look at. But if we go for, a, for certain types of development, then okay, public access to it may be very much more limited than maybe the case before. 
I mean, it would be lovely to think that you know, we hear that the, the county council is closing Grenton Hall, but you know, here it could be a, you know, a new site for doing something exceptionally imaginative. I'm perfectly well aware that neither we nor the county council have got the money for that. But at, at least we don't at the moment. But I just feel it would be a pity that if we, if we took up a quick decision that closed off opportunities that might arise in the future, and the Council, the Council yeah, I think it, it's, it's absolutely vital, Chairman, that everybody should understand that the position of a listed structure which is covered by legislation, the Town and Country Planning Act, brackets, listed structures, brackets, this, that and the other, it is the incumbent upon the owner of such a structure that they should conserve and uh, make, look after it and make use of it. It is also national policy that in some cases it may be necessary for enabling development which is defined as being development which would otherwise not be encouraged because of policies uh, can be used uh, as part of the source of funding. But you have to separate the two. <coughs> For the owner to decide that they want to restore and make use of an historic asset, which they're obliged to do under the law, is not dependent on the source of funding that they might seek to do that. That's not our business. Our business is to decide if an application comes forward for a uh, restoration and conversion, making use of the building, then we have to consider that on its planning merits alone. Whether or not that requires enabling development is down to the owner finding that or other means to fund the work that he's now got permission for, if permission is granted. Where enabling development is placed is not at all tied to the asset that is to be restored using it under, again, national policy. So the, the owner or the developer can put forward any plan and say, look, I know you wouldn't really want me to build houses in position X, Y, or Z, but if I claim that it's enabling me to restore this thing in order to fulfill my obligations and national policy, then you should consider it as such, and so we would we are obliged to do that as a local planning authority. But if the owner of um, a heritage asset listing structure such as this puts forward a plan to restore and make use of it and is successful in gaining permission to do that, they might find some other source of funding. It's up to them. It's not up to us to seek other sources of funding. It really is not our obligation at all. And it is vital that people who are perhaps to be involved in considering an application for the restoration and use of this building, bear in mind that they must not take into account any enabling development that might need be necessary when considering that application. To do so is unlawful. Thank you, Steve, Councillor Charlton, for that uh, good advice. Uh, Councillor Warren, local member. Councillor Warren. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'd just like to say I, I fully agree with uh, Councillor Charlton's opening statement uh, concerning this uh, report. Um, I think um, it, it's uh, a very welcoming way forward for the next process, I believe, within the possible restoration of the hall, and I, I fully support this document. Okay, are there any other comments or observations? If, if not, can we move to the vote on the two recommendations? Those in favour? Agreed. 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 Anyone against? I'll abstain. abstain. Okay, thank you much indeed. Thank you for this tonight's business. Thank you much indeed.